them later, I guess, Jenna. Jenna will let them in. Okay, so welcome everyone to tonight's Limno series. And tonight we have a very exciting lecture presented by Dr. C. Nell. And the title is Visualizing Lake Changes Using R. And um, basically we will just go through a little bit about what GSA is, and then I'll introduce our presenter today, and then she will do the presentation after. If you have any questions, then please ask them at the end of the presentation. And otherwise, we just ask everyone to turn off your or mute your microphone just so there's no background noise. So the Guyan Student Association is made up of um, four members currently. There's a GSA chair, Rosa Chipina, GSA co-chair, Jenna Robinson, who is here with us today, GSA co-chair, Sofia La Fuenta, and GSA hey, advisor, Catherine O'Reilly. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. I think you're not in presenter mode, so it's not changing slides. Really? Huh, that's funny. Let me start it over again then. Apologies for that. Okay, well, just a moment, I guess. Okay, so how about now? Do you guys see the second screen? Okay, yeah. thank you, Jenna. I appreciate it. Okay, so like I was saying, um, these are the members of the Student Association and they're very active and super helpful in <laughs> all the technical difficulties and other organization stuff as well. Uh, particularly, there are three uh, committees. This. Uh, lecture series is organized by the workshop committee. So I'm a member of this. Jenna, Rosie, and Sophia are also members of this. And there are opportunities to join. So if you're interested in anything that we do, then please contact one of us and um, join us. But there are also two other committees. So there's a communications committee, which manages the Gleon blog. There's the uh, seminar series and um, co- coordinate, I guess, the Gleon Slack channel. And then there's also the poster committee, which, you know, prepares all the um, posters and any sessions regarding uh, the Gleon meetings. We also have a Gleon meeting coming up end of October. Um, and I think registration is still open for that until maybe tomorrow. So if you're interested in that or any of these channels and committees, please get in touch with us and um, we look forward to hearing from you. Okay, so today's presenter is Dr. C. Nell, um, who is the lead of the water data visualization team at USGS. And this is known as the USGS Viz Lab. And they have some awesome visualizations. So I just copied a couple in here just for users, but you can go to this link and check out everything that they do. It's really exciting stuff. Um, so what uh, they do over here is basically they design visualize to communicate water science and data to public in form of charts, maps, and interactive websites. And C primarily develops data visualizations using R and JavaScript, leveraging open source tools and publicly available data sets. C currently lives in Madison, Wisconsin in the United States between Lake Mendota and Lake Monona. So thank you so much, C, for being here. And with that, I would like to give it over to you and um, go ahead and close this. Awesome, thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to this. Um, and if you see me looking over to the right, I have like a two screen thing going on. So that's all that's happening there. Um, just like trying to pay attention. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here now. And let's say this will be this is going to be a combination of like a little bit of I have a few slides here, not too many. I'm going to share some websites that I think are interesting, and then I prepared like a an R script that I'll walk through a little bit, um, just showing kind of a few R packages that I like to use, and kind of just like going through the process that I would do to create a data visualization um, in R that hopefully kind of for anybody that's interested provides a foundation to 
start and play around with something and maybe gives you some ideas for something that you could do yourself, maybe with your own data. Can you see my screen? Yes, it's just not in presenter mode yet. Okay, let's do that. Okay, cool. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, so like was already said, I'm C, uh, I use they, them pronouns, and I'm, I work at USGS, uh, currently located in Madison. Um, I have been in this role for about, I guess less, less than three years now. Um, and before that, I, I was an ecologist actually. I didn't actually work in water at all, so lakes um, and the topic are a little bit newer to me, but uh, where I, I'm coming in at this from is like I was an ecologist, I did a PhD uh, in tritrophic interactions, I studied trees, insects, uh, and the birds that eat them. And um, when I was in grad school, I really got into R and started taking these R workshops and really felt compelled about all the visuals and things that, like the power in my hands that I could do uh, kind of just from typing. And eventually that led me to where I am today. Uh, before I was here, I did a postdoc um, that was more data science oriented, visualizing and doing modeling of large scale networks um, until I landed this job. Uh, and I'm at C underscore viz on Twitter if anybody's interested. Okay, so my current role, uh, I'm the team lead for the USGS Viz Lab. We're the water data viz team. This is, we're in the data science branch at USGS. So the data science branch is a whole bunch of things, um, data visualization just being one. You know, we have experts in machine learning, reproducible data pipelining, uh, web analytics, among many other things. And uh, as a group, you know, everybody brings some sort of expertise in programming, either R, Python, or JavaScript. And that's kind of our shared foundation. I mean, so I already shared the link in the chat, uh, but the, the website here is the portfolio for my team. Um, and I'll just pull it up for a second. Um, there's a lot of stuff here, but we do have one lake that viz that is actually pretty popular. Um, I see. I, yeah, can you see? I think we're still only seeing your title slide and not in presenter mode. I don't know if you're changing yet. Oh, interesting, okay. Let me change what I'm sharing here. Do you see like the whole screen or is it this just the one slide? And now we're seeing your USGS uh, webpage. Okay. Yeah, I was just highlighting, you know, we have this whole um, website with a lot of our visualizations on here. It's a little bit, it needs to be updated at this moment. Uh, one of our more popular lake related ones here is this ships in fish habitat under climate change, which gets like around 300 page views a week. Um, even those published, I think over five years ago now. Um, so I recommend that one if you guys are into lakes and that type of stuff. Um, we also share a lot of our work on Twitter on the USGS uh, data science Twitter account. So uh, if you're into it, follow us there. We really like to share the code behind the data visualizations that we make uh, so people can recreate them um, and learn how to use USGS data or learn how to make a data visualization themselves. And I guess the other thing I'll share there is like along with that, we do have a Uh, we do have a GitHub page where all this stuff is kept. For anybody that's interested, I'm gonna pop that in the chat too. Um, so we, we document everything that we're working on here and uh, there's instructions on how to rebuild a lot of the data visualizations, uh, especially the ones that are built in R. We try to make this as easy as possible for somebody to step into. Okay, so the data viz team at USGS, um, we're, not a, we're not a huge team, but there's about uh, four of us that are more or less like full-time on it and then rotating cast of people and collaborators that we're always contributing to. And our shared expertise here, like I said, is you know, R, Python, or JavaScript, um, but we have, have this collective skill set of cartography, um, hydrology, graphic design, uh, and science communication that coming together, you know, everybody brings their own unique skill set uh, that allows us to develop these kind of visually driven narratives that tell stories about science uh, to the public.
not gonna play. Okay. Oh, this one was an animation I thought, but it's not gonna play. So I just wanted to highlight a few uh, kind of lake-based data visualizations that we've made in the last year or so um, through my team or through some projects that we did. So this one here uh, was made by Haley Corson Dosh in Python, and she was using the shoreline development factor to sort uh, like a random selection of lakes just from the least to most circular. So if you look at this chart here, they're all lined up uh, left to right as if you're reading from least to most circular. And then there's like a circle overlay that has the exact same um, area as the lake. And so as you get down to the end, you can see that they almost perfectly match up with Kingsley, Kingsley Lake in Florida. Actually, I kind of want to show, there's a, um, I want to show, there's the other one was an animated version of this one. And we post these things on Reddit sometimes. And this one on Reddit got like 1.2, a uh, million views, which was really cool. And that's kind of the goal of what we're doing. We just want to expose people to data and make, you know, like make data fun um, so they can get more engaged with science and maybe learn something. This one's a little bit more esoteric than a lot of the other things we do, but nevertheless, it was really fun to do. So you can see kind of place through there. Um, and as you go from like the least to most circular uh, there's a little like navigation bar at the bottom showing you where you're at. I know it's a little bit fast to watch. You have to watch it quite a few times to kind of take it in. Uh, and this one was cool because we did get the like 11,000 upvotes. And so it stayed at the top of the uh, Data's Beautiful page for about a day. Um, a lot of people saw it. Uh, a major, another major project we did earlier this year, and we've done it for the last two years now, um, is participating in this social media campaign online called the 30 Day Chart Challenge. And the 30 Day Chart Challenge is just, um, you know, there's a Twitter account that puts out daily prompts for data visualizations for people to make. Uh, and then, you know, the whole community comes together and people are posting them with the same hashtag. And um, it was really fun. We did it as a group here at uh, with the USGS data science branch and other collaborators in USGS. And this is an example of one chart that was made by Simon Top. Um, and this is using Simon has a lake color data set um, that he used here with ray shader to make an elevation map at the bottom and then stacking two hex maps on top showing median lake color over 36 years as well as the number of lakes. Uh, and then the, when you're looking at the top up here, that's looking at uh, that's taking the you know, pixels of color throughout the year, looking at variation like color uh, through time as well as with um, as well as with elevation. So where you see like his XKCD character at the top, uh, and there's like that blank area, like the darker gray. That that's where there's ice cover actually happening. So you're not getting any color, um, and then that changes as it gets warmer. And the all these charts we did. Um, I'm gonna send more links than anybody wants to see probably today. All these charts for this chart challenge we did put in GitHub um, in that repo that I just shared there. Uh, this is one that I made for the chart challenge as well for the prompt, uh, I think it was Pictogram. And at, at USGS, one thing that we, we do is contribute to you know educational materials for water science targeting students or communicating the different uh, research programs that are going on. And so this kind of was uh, served two purposes. One, you know, there's a big saline lakes project that's going on at USGS right now, looking at saline lakes in the West and how, you know, increasing salinity and decreasing water levels relate to uh, patterns of migratory birds and population declines uh, as they migrate, you know, down the West, because as they're, as they're flying through, you know, these saline lakes that are terminal lakes are, create this network of stopover spots for so many critical bird species, but you know, through time um, and as water disappears and drought increases and human water use changes, uh, it's becoming more of a problem. So I'm a part of that project and working on communicating um, that project through data visualizations. So this is just a fun one we did, but uh, this little character guy up here is Salty and Salty is like 
one of the mascots for the USGS Water Science School. Um, and then I thought I'd just do a little pitch here as it, as it related to that, because um, my team has this really big uh, project release coming out next week for the water cycle, and we're having a big uh, virtual release party online that's open to anybody to join. Um, we've been working for the last 18 months to redesign this classic water cycle diagram that USGS um, has provided online and is used as an educational resource around the world. You know, it's translated into 60 languages um, and it's been around for 20 years. So what we did is uh, upgraded it to increase the scientific accuracy, um, the, like aesthetic design, as well as the usability and educational settings for the diagram. And it's been this really fun, really cool project to do. Um, and so I invite anybody to join that would be interested. And there's, I don't have, I'm not sure where the link is for that actually. Um, but there, there is like a virtual event uh, next week on the 13th where there will be guest speakers and like a free giveaway of, you know, a printed poster and things like that. Okay, so when I think about data visualization, um, and how to design one, I kind of, it always comes down to three core points of like what makes it effective data visualization. And that is like, what are the data? You know, what is the message and who's the audience that you're trying to reach? Um, and, you know, outside of those three things, I feel, I feel like there's a pretty broad range of things that you can do. You know, you have a lot of freedom and how you communicate it and how you show data. And for me, that's like the fun creative space to work in. But when I think about the data, you know, that puts, a certain constraint on what you can do just because you know you need to know what types of data you have do you have continuous data variables you know is it a time series are you working with categorical data is it spatial um that will ultimately define like what type of chart you can do because you know you can't make a scatter plot if you have categorical data only for example um and so it can be limiting in that way but there are that said there's a huge number of different chart types that can be used depending on what kind of that you have. And so the next thing I usually think about then is, you know, what is the message that you want to put out there? Um, and that usually is one of the biggest driving forces because depending on the message that you want to communicate, um, the chart type can really inform how you tell that story. So here, you know, this slide is just showing on the left, the labels are just, you know, different types of messages that you might want to show. Um, are you looking at, if you're looking at composition, you see that red row right there, you know, there's all those different chart types that could show composition a different way. Or if you want to make a comparison, you know, you don't necessarily need to use a bar chart, um, but you have a wider variety of options. Uh, and that is kind of a fun creative space to be able to work in. Um, and then the last piece being who is your audience? You know, is it for a technical audience that needs to get specific, you know, numerical details out of something? Is this something that is designed for Twitter, do you just want to increase appeal and get people to maybe read a paper or just, you know, have fun with something? Or, you know, is it for maybe even a policymaker that's going to be making an educated decision uh, based on it and you need to provide certain kinds of details? And so when you bring these three things together, I think that those are, that's the key recipes for, those are the key components of a um, ineffective data visualization. And this visual that I'm showing here is just from, it's compiled from this website from data to viz which is just one of many different sites that um, that kind of provide like this basis of inspiration if you're ever feeling kind of stuck in, you know, your chart design and what you're trying to do. So here you can see they break it down like, okay, you have numeric data, one or two numeric variables. You know, these are some of the different options of chart types you can use. And when I was really starting out with DataViz, I found this to be really helpful to help me like expand and think beyond, you know, what I was used to, for example, like, a ridge line chart like this, you know, maybe I had a, I wasn't familiar with it until I actually saw this possibility in front of me. And what I like about this site too is, as you if you click on them, um, it's going to connect. Okay, maybe not that one. It'll connect you to the R, R graph gallery, which will then bring you to you know specific examples of exactly how to make these charts in R. Um, and so that's a great way to just start out and learn a bunch of new things. And there's a few other types of websites like this. For example, the State of Is project, which just compiles like all of these different charts. Um, and so, if you're starting out in Data Viz or just trying to break out of your box, uh, these can be really useful to think about. 
and like I was saying, as far as like the messaging goes, uh, they also have the website itself broken out into that way, right? So here, say you want to show flow, um, you could do a Sankey that's showing, you know, movement between different steps. You have a network, you have an arc diagram, you have a bunch of different options. Okay. And that is all I really had for um, more or less for slides at this moment. Uh, and I wanted to get into kind of going through an R script that I prepared. And so this is actually a visualization based on a data set that I'm going to use as an example. Um, and I'm gonna sit in chat right now, if anybody's interested in trying to follow along or uh, anything, um, there, I made a GitHub repo that has this R script in it that I'm gonna be working from. And so that link that I just sent is this one. And I'm just gonna pull up an R the same R script. So you'll see that I provided notes and links to where all of the data can be found. Um, the, there's two data sets that I'm gonna use and they're pretty large. So I have filtered them a little bit and served them up. So they're uh, a little bit quicker to use, um, but the steps in filtering them are documented uh, in the in the comments here and this first one I think it's worth noting that it's a it is a global data set so I filtered it to the contiguous United States um, because that's where I live and where I'm familiar with but the same steps that I'm going to do here could be applied to any region of the world uh, that you'd be interested in and as I go through this um, anybody could feel free to interrupt me or ask questions. And it's going to be a little bit informal if you have something that you're trying to do maybe in R like and want help troubleshooting. I'm happy to try and answer those things. You know, there's no guarantee like how good I am on the fly at that, but it's always kind of a fun challenge. Okay, so starting out um, at the top of the script here, I, I've put a bunch of things in the comments too. I've commented out pieces that I'm not going to run, but would be useful to do there. And for example, if you haven't installed all these packages, you're going to need to uncomment it like this to be able to run it. Um, and I am going to assume kind of like a basic understanding of R in the tidyverse, but the script it should be set up that if you're able to, you know, just run by line by line, it should work for you. Okay, so the first data set here is the Global Lake Area Climate and Population data set. Um, and this contains lake surface area data for over 1.2 million lakes globally between 1995 and 2015. Um, and I learned about this data set from my friend Michael Meyer. And so I was excited to use it after he made that uh, rotating, rotating map for the uh, chart challenge that I mentioned earlier. And so some of the initial processing steps here are actually done by him. And I've just pulled out the data from that and I've linked here where that happens. So uh, the first thing to do, and I is reading in it, reading in the data set here. And when you look at it, you'll see um, there's a number of variables and the key ones are, uh, you know, there's a year, there's a lake ID, there's lake locations, um, and then there's, you know, seasonal, permanent, and total uh, surface area, water surface area, where the permanent water is uh, water present for all observable months within a year, and the seasonal is at least one month of all observable months within a year, total being both of those. I see. Um, the first thing that I'm going to do here, too, is because it is so big, um, adding in... Uh, we don't see your... US... Sorry to interrupt yeah. you. We don't see your R script right now. We see the no. GitHub web page. That's so weird. Okay. So does it seem to want me to switch between windows? Can you see it now? We can. Thank you. All right. All right, cool. So I was just here um, reading in the data. It takes a minute to read in. I've already read it in, so I'm going to steam through that. But um, I've set up a projection here and reading in state shape files. If you do a little, this should work. You know, this is just, these are just shape, uh, polygons for uh, contigu contiguous US states. And here I'm just taking it and 
turning the GLCP into using the uh, centroids for each of the lakes in the data set to making them spatial and then intersecting them with the state polygons so that we can, it's easy to see which state um, each of the lakes are in. And so that, the, that takes a couple minutes to run, but the result of that is this addition of, you know, like a name onto the data frame that has the state, as well as some uh, details about the states that are embedded in those state polygons. And they're now, it's now it has like a spatial geometry. I mean, if you look at it, there's a bunch of different, there's different regions of the US, uh, which you're seeing in the map over here. And I've set this up so you could pick any of any of those regions and do filtering. I'm just going to go with the Midwest and filter it to that. And what we're seeing here is we have about. Um, it's going to take a minute, I guess. A certain number of lakes. Twenty thousand lakes. Um, and so the first thing I always like to do in any data visualization project is just like try and plot all the data right away. Well, you know, like just see what's in front of me and see what speaks to me especially if it's something I'm less familiar with. Um, I, I find it helps move things forward a lot more quickly if I can just put it all and kind of try and plot every data point as much as possible, uh, as soon as possible. I'm wondering if this is gonna be slow, slower than expected. Um, so the first plot that I'm doing here and I'll just explain, you know, the how the kind of basic anatomy of a ggplot is set up. I like to always put my data frame first, and then I use this R pipe to say, you know, apply everything here to, to that data that's on the left-hand side. So it's just creating a base ggplot where the x-axis is year, y is the total uh, surface area, and then I'm adding a group for each lake and coloring it by the state name. And so now that the chart pulled up, you can see like just immediately looking at this, it's kind of like, ouch, it's, um, there's not there's not a lot to take away from it, right? Because there's this huge variation in the total surface area that it's sort of just this, a couple of the lakes at the top, you can see some patterns that are happening there, but it really kind of hides um, what's happening in lakes that are smaller than these really big ones. And also, you know, I, as somebody that is into design, I just can't stand the, uh, the base, ggplot default. And so one thing I always like to do at the beginning of my scripts too is do this theme set and just uh, add like a default plotting that's gonna be applied to all plots thereafter uh, within that theme classic that I'm applying it to. You can set a base size for any of the fonts which will scale them up, um, everything up relatively. And I find that can be pretty useful. Okay, and so because there is this high variation in um, lake surface areas, and I'm interested more in the trends, right? The title of this talk was like visualizing lake change. I wanna know kind of the change um, across lakes and not necessarily like the variation in size, that like absolute variation in size. So the next thing that I'm doing here is just for each lake, um, scaling the, the surface, these surface area variables uh, within each lake. So then it'll represent the uh, variation within each lake rather than the variation across lakes, like the, I mean, the the magnitude of like just lake size. And so after running that, um, I'm using this mutate across. So it's taking all three of the lake area variables and applying this rescaling and creating a new variable that has underscore scale at the end. And you can see that in what's printed out here at the bottom now. So not only is there the seasonal, kilometers squared, but there's also seasonal kilometers squared scale. And so just going from there, kind of replotting almost the exact same thing, um, but I did add one other line here, which is the facet wrap. And I think facets are uh, one of my favorite things to do when plotting. And so facet is just a small multiple and it's gonna take the same plot that you define and just create a series of versions of it based on the variable that's put here next to the tilde. So name in this case is the name of the state. So what should pop up here is, you know, that same plot that we just saw with like, uh, where it's year on the x-axis and area on the y, um, but there's gonna be a separate box for each state. Okay, so 
we're seeing something really different now, right? Before the lines were separated, now it's like this kind of like fuzzy caterpillar appearance. Um, and this is also kind of hard to take a lot away from, right? Uh, there, what I see is, you know, there's a lot of variation from year to year, which is what we would expect because, you know, there is so much climatic variation year to year. Um, and so the next thing I want to do here is just filter it down a little bit to maybe make the script go a little bit faster. Um, but look at how this variation that we're seeing uh, from year to year really plays out spatially, because maybe that'll give us some more information about it. And so I'm setting this up. So I'll just use Wisconsin and filter to Wisconsin. And then I am using this Geom SF. So this is the SF package, which use, is good for um, working with polygons, the vector data in R, and it has its own ggplot uh, layers that you can use that make it really easy to do some quick plotting. And now I switched the facet wrap to year. So we should expect to see a small plot for each year. So potentially visually, we can see um, you know, how things are changing in space and time simultaneously. And this style of plot, I think, can be really compelling. Um, there's somebody on Twitter named Dominic Roy, Roy who does a lot of these small multiple facets with climate data. And I find that they can be a really effective way to show you know, the complexity and variation in certain variables I'm just going to exit something on this. Okay, so now that that worked, um, we have like all these little series of little Wisconsin maps. And I did use here uh, one of my favorite color palette libraries, which I think is worth noting. It's called Psycho um, Scientific Colors is what that stands for. And if you, it's really useful because these are color palettes that are designed for use in science um, and to be accessible. Uh, and they do that, they're, if you go to this link, I can show. They do that by being perceptually uniform. And what that means is that, you know, like, the colors are spaced along the gradient in a way that is also like parallel to how your brain interprets it visually. You know, the color spacing maps to the data um, in an equivalent way. And there are papers out about, about these color palettes actually that have been developed. They're available in R and Python and for much broader use. Um, and if you want to see the whole array of them, you can do, uh, there's a function built in because I always forget the names, but there, there's a whole bunch of them. And so like this battle one, for example, is one that's been designed to be like the new and better rainbow because there's a lot of problems with like color vision deficiency in rainbow color palettes. But this one goes, you know, you, you can see it goes from a dark to a light hue and it's using a slightly different range of colors, which make it um, better for uh, people with vision, vis color vision deficiencies. You'll also notice that a lot of these color palettes are kind of diverging color palettes that maybe have a, like a light or dark color in the middle, uh, which can be really useful when you want to center a variable on zero, which I'm going to do later in the script. I'm um, going to have that not kind of stand out, but have the extreme stand out, which is really useful when you when you do want to show change, right? Because change is variation kind of from a central place. Um, another cool one that I'll just point out is like this. Hi, see, you, sorry. One. Sorry to yeah. interrupt again. We're still seeing the, the R um, studio window. Yeah, but can you see the color plot plots? No, there's no plot I'm showing right now. Ugh. All right. I have a plot up in my R. I'm not really sure because then it's just not showing what I'm uh, what's on my R studio. Can you see there, we can see it now. Yep. All right. Sorry about that. 
so yeah, I was mentioning um, there's there are these color ramps like Bukavu, uh, which is designed. You know, you can see this blue gradient and then this green to brown and uh, centered on zero. This is can be used for elevation where you have like water um, and then terrain maps to each other. And so, uh, in the plot that I showed before, I was using the Brock one because it's centered on white and I wanted to using the the z squared values be able to show where um, lake surface areas diverge from their mean where zero would represent the mean so I'm going to uncomment a few of these things I think it might take a minute to run um, uh, but you can switch the direction just using the plotting function by adding a negative one and I'm doing that because the default it did it was showing that you know lakes getting smaller were blue um, and I want it to be the opposite. Does that show up there? Yeah, we can see that. Thank you. All right. Hopefully. And so I did another thing here. Um, I changed the labeling on the scale just by setting default breaks in labels uh, because the z-score for me isn't like necessarily that intuitive to interpret and say I wanted to make this for somebody that didn't understand that. So now, you know, like the naming convention here just reflects what's happening in time. And so one thing that does stand out here is like this 2012, we're getting like really dark greens. Um, something was going on and lakes are smaller that year. Um, and we could mess around with this chart a little bit more. For example, you know, changing changing the plotting theme a little bit to give it a little bit more of a custom look. Um, and one thing I like about our is not that long ago they added these kind of customization options for the legends itself. So here um, just doing a few things to the color bar where you can you can if you have multiple scales that you're defining you can specifically set parameters for them so here i'm going to switch that scale so it's oops so it's going horizontally um and setting some metrics on how i want that to look i'm also giving it a title that's reading in the state that i selected and setting some you know defining how those labels are going to look um, and so this like where it says color here in guides that directly corresponds to where I'm defining the color in the aesthetics uh, here. So that's the AES and anything you put within that, you know, you can define color scale. Um, uh, I mean, sorry, color size, like fill, shape, a bunch of things. And if you can assign them to different variables. So it's going to map how that looks to the variable in your data. And that's different than here, where you see this size, where it's outside of the parentheses there. Um, and that is just going to be defined uh, like as a static size that gets applied broadly across everything. So here I might change the layout here a little bit. So there's fewer rows. And line them up. I think there's 21 years here, so it should split evenly with three. Okay, and the labels aren't. Oh, okay. I didn't undo this one. And so, one thing that I really like. Um, I feel like makes the chart look nice is always a dark theme. And so there is this package GG dark that will just invert the plotting theme that you're using. Um, so that's what I've got going on here. And I think to do that, I'm going to switch my color palette where I go. I can't remember what it's called though. Um, I want like a similar color palette that's diverging and centered on a neutral color, but uh, a darker color. So I'm going to take this Tofino one and put it in there. Let's see what happens. Okay. 
enough to so there we go um just with a few little additions here in the guides and the plotting theme changing the color you know you can take your kind of simpler plot and show a lot there and you know i i like the dark plotting theme because the screen here then really stands out and you can see how through time there is this kind of like gradation and change where um not only spatially but like through time uh you're seeing bigger lakes in earlier years and then the frequency of lakes getting smaller compared to their 20 year average is increasing once you get into the later like 2000s that are here so just save this one And so this is something that you could recreate if you went up here back and edited the state um, or the region to anywhere in the world. Uh, the initial data set was filtered just to the US, but it's available globally. So it would be cool to see how, um, how the same chart looks for a bunch of different regions. Okay, and then because I was using that, I'm gonna, now I'm gonna move on to a different chart. Um, and so because I was using that GG dark, uh, you know, plotting theme, you, you have to turn it off because it modifies like how your plotting themes are working. Um, and I wouldn't, I'm not gonna use it moving forward. So the next chart I'm gonna do is inspired by um, the, I don't know if you've seen these like climate spirals where it's like a circular chart uh, that animates through time and you can see, you know, um, they're often used like to, to show temperature precipitation in different regions um, and like, you know, if there's change in time, it spreads out. And so I wanted to do something like that, but apply to lakes. And so uh, my colleagues here at USGS have this lake data set that they put out not that long ago um, where they have daily surface temper temperature predictions for over eight, um, 185,000 lakes in the U.S. So you can find that data set here. Again, I have downloaded it and filtered it down a little bit. And I've filtered it down just to Lake Mendota, which is like my closest lake here. Um, and when I'm reading it in, I'm just using Luberday to create a few different date parameters because that, that makes it easier for me to kind of manipulate how the axes are working um, and eventually when we get into making a circular plot. So if we look at that, you can see we've got a date variable surf temp, which is the surface temperature predictions. Um, this is just the lake NHG ID that corresponds to the USGS uh, NHG plus, which contains, you know, polygons for lakes and other water features across the country. Um, so that's just the one for Mendota. Um, there's a year parameter that I created and then separate ones for month and Y day um, and Y day just being a day of the year. So one through 365. So again, I just like to apply everything first. See what it looks like. I'm using a different color palette here uh, the, from the same package though. This one's the Roma. Um, so it's just doing like a kind of hot to cold thing here, which ends up looking like a rainbow. And then in the on the x-axis, I'm using this like scaled date um, layer where I can set, I'm setting the breaks and labels specifically uh, using the scales package. I find this scale, scales package to be super useful because it gives you a really intuitive way to set the intervals um, on any of your axes, especially when it comes to dates. So this one, for example, I can write in two years, uh, two years actually is a little bit crowded. So maybe just say five years and it's gonna space it out like that. And it understands, um, it understands that pretty well. Okay, and so this one's pretty, um, but I might wanna clean it up a little bit more and manipulate it a little bit more to like really communicate change. Cause we see a lot of this like variation, which we know that happens, you know, within a year, um, but you know, a little bit interested, a little bit more broadly, like what's happening across years, you know, are the highest temperatures getting higher, lowest temperatures, like um, also increasing. And so one day to, one way to look at that is to compare um, current temperatures or more recent temperatures to some sort of, sort of historic past. And in this case, the data set goes from 1981 to 2020. And so I'm just going to use the first decade of that as kind of like our historical past frame of reference. Um, you know, in climate analyses, you would probably usually use a larger time period, but I just wanted to have a little bit more to work with. So I'm just taking the average surface temperature for each day of the year um, over that time. So there's a daily average surface temperature, joining it back with our original data and calculating like what's the difference in the more recent surface temperature predictions versus that historical mean. And then here, I'm gonna just plot it 
uh, the same way, but now it's the difference. And I also, I guess it's not exactly the same, but I'm using the same colors. And so I'm also here adding a line um, at zero, which would represent no difference, you know, from that historical mean. And then the variation you see above the line, uh, it's warmer, below the line it's colder. And so this becomes a little bit more interesting uh, where you can see where things are diverging from white, what might be expected based on that past record. Um, and so say I wanted to take this and share it out, I might do a few more things to clean it up. One thing I like to do is just add a new font um, because I don't know, I like fonts. <laughs> I guess that's the reason. Um, but adding a font is pretty easy in ggplot. Um, and I, I use Google fonts. The link is here of where I get those from. And I like to use the show text package. There's a couple other packages that you can use them for, uh, use for that. But there's, but um, this one I find to be pretty easy because it works so well with Google fonts. Uh, it's pretty much as easy as putting in the name of the font that you want, you import it here. Um, because Source Sans Pro, the one that I like to use, it has a, a lot of variable widths. Um, I can set, you know, specifically how thick I want or thin I want it to be when it's like a bold font face versus not. And so just running those things loads them into the system and then they're available for use in your ggplot. Um, so I'm adding that down here in my theme elements. And maybe I'm not, yeah, in my theme elements, I'm just setting, uh, I'm just defining the text. And so I guess I haven't gone into theme elements that much, but they follow this consistent syntax where you have, you know, your plot element that has a name and then you set it up, um, you set it up with element text. If it's text, there's element rect. If it's some sort of like rectangular item, um, there's element line, you know, for your axes, lines, things like that. And within the parentheses here, you can set a whole variety of parameters. So, and they're gonna be the same for, you know, all element texts will have the same things you can set. So font family down here, you can see I'm setting, you know, for the title, like the font size. And I say, well, I want the title to be bold. Um, I'm also just taking away the legend because here I'm mostly just using it for an aesthetic thing and the values associated with those colors can be interpreted from the Y axis. So it's to me seemed unnecessary. And then I was just adding a white backing behind this plot. Um, let's see if I did anything else. Uh, up here, I did specifically also set the midpoint of the color scale to be zero. Um, so it would be centered on that where the warmer colors are representing warmer and the cooler colors are representing cooler. I might change this I axis again. Let's just see what that looks like. Okay. So, oh yeah, and here I'm using a different theme, I guess, too, it looks like. Yeah, the theme minimal, which has these default um, grid lines that come in. And I decided to go for that just to mix up the style and pulling off the actual like axis lines themselves as well um, to give it a little bit of a different look. And, you know, I kind of like the plotting differences. I think it can be really compelling and there's a bunch of different ways that you can do it. So instead of doing the points, I could do like a bar um, instead of pretty much the same. But one thing to change is, uh, you know, a, a point you define the color as color, um, but in, GeoBar, you would use a fill and color in GeoBar would actually be like the outline of the bar where the fill is the interior. So to have that match, and if I were to run this right now, it's going to look funny. I mean, it looks kind of cool actually, but, um, <laughs> but what it doesn't have the same colors because in my scale layer here, um, it's setting the color and now I'm using the fill in my aesthetics, right? So to match that, I would need to change this to be fill. And you can set both the color and the fill if you want to like separately as well. Um, in this case, because the bars are so thin, I think uh, there's not a lot of added value in that. Like it's hard to even see some of the variation in the color that you got from the points in that one, but um, you, what you do see are the spikes where it is diverging from that central point, which is kind of cool. Let's save that. Okay, so this is kind of the foundation of the climate spiral type of chart that I wanted to make, um, right? It's, but it's not a, a spiral, obviously. And a really powerful layer that you can use in ggplot is chord polar, which just takes the coordinates of any plot 
um, and it makes them circular, but you do need to set up the plot in a certain way that it is kind of sensible. And so um, I'm not gonna, this I'll skip for a minute, but it's just setting up how things get labeled later. Um, so this plot in the beginning is almost exactly the same as the prior, but instead of having the date through time as the X axis, I'm setting that to the Y day or like the day of the year. So it's just going one through 365. And that's because in the circle, we want one you know cycle around the circle to be representative of one year. And then the temperature difference, again, here's the Y value. So I'm going back to points and using the color parameter again. Um, and just like another, a different plotting uh, color palette here. Vic, it's like, that's another one of those diverging ones. So it's, it goes from like red to blue, um, where blue is gonna be, it's getting colder and red's warmer. And then here I'm just plopping in that cord polar. So it wraps it around in a circle. Um, I'm keeping the, I'm keeping the line that goes through the center that represents no difference from the past. So that'll be on the plot. And then uh, just setting a few things to define the labels and the plot. And I'm not gonna, let's look at this first. And so that's what comes out of that, um, where you can see the diverging colors. And this is every year plotted on top of each other. So this is kind of the distribution of temperatures in time throughout the year over a 30 year period. Um, and so, right, like as you would expect, uh, I guess actually not necessarily as you would expect, I, I didn't know what to expect with this. You could do it differently. Like it doesn't need to necessarily, we could go back to just the surface temperature instead of the difference, or I would wanna change these two things back and just maybe we wanna just see like, uh, what is the variation in temperature throughout the year? And so that's what that looks like, um, where this is where what you'd expect, you know, like in those winter months, it's really cold. The lake is probably actually frozen um, and it fluctuates out during the year. Okay, but I think the added novelty of the climate spiral or that type of visualization is to be able to see how it's changing through time, right? And so this is where I'm gonna bring in, you know, one thing I really love is animations and ggplot and gganimate make it very easy to animate kind of simple plots. And so, especially things with time. So here there's just a simple layer from GG Animate that I add where I'm saying year. So I want it to recognize, you know, that year years are the steps that are we're gonna animate through time. To get that to work, I also need to have year as a grouping variable um, in, the, in the plotting layer. Uh, so it knows, you know, what, what year responds to what data. Another thing I'm adding here is this shadow mark. And that is just um, what that's doing is like after the points appear, it's just gonna fade them out a little bit. So it's easier to see what the, what the most recent, uh, like what the most recently added layer is, and then a little bit of a title and a cleanup on that uh, legend on the bottom to make it a little bit more readable. And so these take a minute to um, render. One thing that um, if you're not familiar, you know, if you're ever putting text on a plot and you want it to split in lines, putting this like backslash N where you want the line split to go um, is going to do that. So you can see it breaks in the legend. Okay, so that's worked. It's not actually exactly what I would expect. Okay, you can see, yeah, there you go as like it goes through time. So I think one thing that happened here is I, I'm using a different Y variable than like the color. So there's kind of a mismatch there. Um, I'm gonna switch that back. And so the the actual climate spiral, you know, it animates like a line through time going day by day, um, and you'll see it spiraling. And that's not what's happening here or what's gonna happen this next one uh, because I have it mapped to the year, so it's accumulating years through time. If I were to change this and do it to the actual date, that's when you would get that effect. Um, it would just take like 30 minutes for it to render, so it's not really reasonable for this moment, but if you're interested in trying it out, I would say explore that. So you can see now as it plays through time, um, it's adding on these layers, and 
the temperatures are getting further and further away from that expected, you know, like mean value as we come closer to the presence. And now I just uh, changed out the GG title layer, layer here because there's another nice feature of GG Animate where I can put frame time um, because it knows I'm using time to transition here. And it's going to create a label that just updates as it animates uh, that says what year is being shown or like what year's updating at that moment. There we go. And so, you know, once you get a gift that you like and you want to keep it, you can um, assign it a name up here. And then this animate uh, this animate function here is just defining a few things of like the speed that we want to play out, the export size that we want it to be, and like how many frames you want it to play. So this I'm just setting a single frame for each year. But if you change that, um, it'll start interpolating between points, and you'll see like the dots start flying around. Uh, but it will take longer to render. And so then having that, um, just save like that. All right, um, and that is the end of my script. And I think we're at about an hour here. Um, so stop sharing, but yeah, I hope that was like fun and maybe uh, you learned something um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes, thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, I think it was like super interesting how you did it like interactively, you know, how you actually showed us what to change and um, all those details. So that was super, super cool. And all the links that you provided were really great too. So thank you. Um, are there any questions to see from the audience? <laughs> yeah, I think everyone was just blown away by the visuals, so <laughs> well done. Um, I do have a question, actually, because you mentioned that you work on networks as well. And yeah. I was wondering, like, what do you recommend for visualizing networks? Because that's a whole different idea. And is there anything within R or outside R? Yeah, you know, I in my origin, I'm like a hardcore R user. Now I do JavaScript, so I do a little bit some other stuff, but like I learned it all doing it in R. Um, and so there is like the iGraph package, which um, is designed for a bunch of network stuff and you can apply different like algorithms and clustering things there. And that one's kind of like the primary one that you'll see if you look it up, like how to do it in R and it's good, but it is more, it's a totally different syntax than, you know, like everything that I just showed you. And so one or a pair of packages that I really like are there's a the tidy graph and uh, I think it's GG graph, GG graph, um, and they work really well together. And that's just bringing the tidyverse to network visualizations, as well as like any sort of like hierarchical data visualization. Um, and so I find those great because you can apply those same kind of like color palettes, the same styling and theme that you learn in ggplot to them. And it makes it that that for me just makes it so much easier to work in. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the suggestions. I also have a question. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I also wonder your experience about for a uh, while you're working raster data. A few years ago, I was working as a GIS expert, and mostly we were using, you know, QGIS, ArcGIS for visualization purposes. And I, when I try, you know, some analysis in R, I came across that R is so slow in processing <laughs> raster. So, how was the situation nowadays? Do you recommend R <laughs> or other platforms for raster data? Um, I, yeah, like I, I still default to R, but I think that is definitely a challenge. Like, is plotting big rasters in R can be super slow. There's some new new packages that are out though, like GG Spatial and 
um, the Terra package, which is kind of like the new evolution of the raster package, but better, and it's making things faster and changing how that works. And so I would recommend those, but there's definitely like, it's going to be slower than doing something in ArcGIS. Um, but there is the added benefit of being able to like completely script something. So, you know, once you've written it, you can do it over and over again. So maybe you can put it like, I don't know, use some computing power or just let it run in the background, like over. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that is definitely, definitely a, like a major challenge that I still haven't like found the perfect solution for. Yeah, the SF package is also great for spatial data uh, in R. And then those all work together really well. Thank you. All right. Any final questions for Steve? 